The National Human Development Report of UNDP highlights that the unfortunate soft underbelly, if I may use that expression, Chief Minister, if you don't mind, is Baluchistan. 15 years have elapsed and there has been no growth in real per capita income in Baluchistan. Despite the so-called fiscal equalization by the seventh NFC award, Baluchistan has not moved ahead. And you know what the nature of the problem is. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you Dr. Bengali for a very, very stimulating and passionate introduction. And I will turn now to Dr. Uh, Kader, uh, uh, Shah, uh, Shahid Kardar, who has a very distinguished record of being involved in policy making in this country as a former governor of the State Bank of Pakistan and a number of other positions. I'd like you to take you to the contemporary context, if I may, uh, Kardar Saab. The first question is, what do you think has been the impact of COVID-19 on inequality in our country. And in your assessment, has our government done enough to alleviate the loss of lives and livelihoods that we saw over the last one and a half years, almost? My second question is in perhaps even more sensitive question, but as a former central bank governor, you will be able to handle it. The prior actions and other reforms which we are being compelled to implement in the ongoing IMF reform back as part of the program under the sixth review, there are some of the toughest reforms proposed in the history of our country. Are they likely to be helpful in reducing inequality? Or is there a real risk that they will exacerbate? inequality issues. So Kardar Saab, two very pointed questions, COVID and its impact, and what is likely to happen with the IMF program reforms being implemented. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, let me start by paying homage to two of my mentors. Uh, two great warriors, uh, they were always comrades in arms. Uh, of course, Asma and Mr. I. Rahman. I've spent my lifetime with them as a founder member of the HRCP and the so-called lifelong treasurer of that institution. I've never met people like them who could have fought so courageously against what you and I would call the tyranny of state institutions and of course all kinds of social injustices. So, so for me it was a unique pleasure to have known them and befriended them. Now, um, let me uh, just uh, start off by saying two, three things very quickly uh, in support of what Paisab and uh, Kessler have said. Uh, of course, the visual contrast that we see uh, in the lifestyles of the rich and the poor couldn't have been more stark in this country now. I mean, one of the things that uh, Kessler mentioned, I'm just em emphasizing it. In our, uh, in, in my younger days, the, that feels like prehistoric times, we went to the same schools, uh, we went to the same institutions. Our children, by the way, don't go to the same colleges, go, don't go to the same institutions, follow Manchester United. They're... So in a sense, they, they, they frankly, and the walls which separate them the poor cannot really cross. So the social mobility aspect has actually been denuded completely over the several years. One of the areas that I'd like to highlight, because that also brings into the question of the IMF program, those of you who read the press must have noticed uh, you know, the complaint about imports, what's happening to our external account. I think what we forget is the impact of inequality on that. And let me just illustrate it with some. What are luxury cars? When you import luxury cars, that's included in the import bill. And then, of course, you start 
the import of parts, then you have oil. Consumer products, again, because the elite can afford them. I, I hate the word elite because I really often wonder how to classify it in terms of groups. Or in, okay. Recreational travel, Hajj and Umrah, I mean, in case we don't realize in the impact of the exchange rate, on the exchange rate, Hajj and Umrah, by the way, annually costs us $3 billion. Yeah. And then we forget conveniently the, the 50,000 students who go abroad every year. That's another $3 billion, by the way, $3 billion, because of assuming they actually study for roughly two to two and a half years abroad. So in a sense, which is the 20% I keep asking? I mean, you, look, you drive down any of the even middle class localities, there are, these are, these are essentially half a million dollar houses. So which is the 20%? I keep asking myself. And I'll come to where I depart from the two of them to raise questions which I keep wondering myself. And I'll come to them in the end. Well, let me respond to the two specific questions that have been asked. According to government's own surveys, almost 12% of the population, uh, the employed labor force became unemployed. So which a labor force of 65 million, 12% is roughly 550,000 people who lost their jobs. And some of them will never get their jobs back. A lot of consolidation took place, particularly in the retail sector, which is really the much more labor intensive sector. And because I happen to know a lot of them, uh, they're either parts of a family or very close friends, there has been a lot of consolidation in, in terms of the number of retail outlets. Uh, so in a sense, when you look at what is happening, a lot of the salaries were halved. Uh, some of them came back, but not kept pace with inflation. Uh, so some of them returned to their salaries almost 18 months later, but no revisions in terms of the impact of inflation that uh, Kessel talked about. Um, so 14 million households the government has been trying to help, uh, roughly 1,000 rupees per, per family per month, which is 12,000 rupees a year, but even on a quarterly basis. And now, of course, is advertised another program which has not yet been uh, in, implemented, but certainly been announced, of 120 billion rupees, uh, which will cover um, roughly, which will cover these households for an additional six months. That's over consumer products, um, or, although 65% will have to be borne by the provinces. So in a sense, some things have happened. Uh, people have been hit very badly by COVID and, of course, the inflation, the inflation part. Inflation, in fact, has had the more damaging impact. COVID, far less now but inflation has been the more damaging part to what has happened. And how it has affected social cohesion, I think, is something that we need to add. Pakistan, frankly, has become a, a very, very difficult country to govern. We take that very lightly. Okay. I'll come to it. We take that very lightly. I mean, it would be challenging for the most capable leadership anywhere in the world. The kind of crises, uh, and we talked about the the provincial dimension, uh, the fact of the lack of social cohesion, the alienation between the youth of different provinces, and then, of course, between the different socioeconomic classes. So, so, in a sense, what we have managed to create is an overburdening state structure, which has been, uh, and of course, the imperatives of the security state, not, let me not go into those, but that has created a burden which all of us are now having to finance, and I'm talking about the poor much more than anyone else. And that brings me to the final part of the question, but I'll make a presentation later on what I think of the inequality aspect, which some of the dimensions are not, in my opinion, taken care of. So the IMF program, because it assumes, and, and to, to a large extent, because IMF programs are essential for three, months, uh, for three years, and now it ends in September, much of the burden is going to be through indirect taxes, 
because that's all they're interested in. They're looking at numbers. Mm. They're not looking at how changes should take place in society. That's not their business. It's our business to correct the house in order. It's, we seem to think that we have an open-ended license to mismanage our affairs when someone should come and bail us out. Oh, it was great. Uh, the Cold War, the 9-11, you know, the, the war against terror, the Afghan war, and then, of course, 9-11 uh, uh, and so on. And no one can really help a country of 220 million people. So let's first be clear. So all the adjustments have to be done here. Surgery is required. You can't take the patient abroad. The patient will be here, and the doctors have to be local. Now, how that surgery will take place is something, is the debate that needs to be taken, the debate that needs to be made. Now, in terms of the IMF program, unfortunately, the focus is now on the indirect taxes part, which is the GST part. And for the poor, the impact will be huge. Yes. A lot of the you know, items which had been exempted from sale tax will now be subjected to sales tax at 17% with an already inflated cost of consumer goods because of inflation. And this will put a burden far more. And um, Kasser mentioned the fact that they were pulling children out of school. Two things are also happening. One, uh, apart from the fact that, they, so now, the malnutrition part will increase. It is already, by the way, rising. And some of the unemployed in the urban areas, frankly, are going back to their villages. Yeah. That's the other interesting or sad part which is happening simultaneously as we speak. So I'll stop here Thank you. just to uh, you know, address the two questions. But there are other areas that need to be talked about. Thank you. <laughs> Let me tell you also that uh, when we wrote this in the United Nations Development Program, Human Development Report, where it's types of government and impact on inequality varies, you can imagine what I had to go through. But I'm still alive, Allah ka shukar. So now let me turn to the next very important question. Again, it is hardcore policy question, and none better than Mr. Kartar. One of the very <clears throat> strange and unusual characteristics of the taxation system of Pakistan is that if you include the withholding taxes of an indirect nature in income tax, you will be really amazed to know that almost 75% of tax revenues accrue in the form of indirect taxes. And Mr. Kada referred to the fact that this is going to get worse with the IMF program. One would like to know what has been the historical reason why Pakistan has this disproportionate dependence on indirect taxes which fall disproportionately on the poorer sections of our society. Kardar Saab, please enlighten us. I think it's fairly well uh, documented by now that the more affluent segments of society were able to have that kind of access. I mean, let's start with the, the, the feudal, the large landowners. They've exempted themselves from taxes and they sit in parliament, most of them. So in a sense, a, a good source of income which should really be taxed based on their ability to bear a particular burden, they are not doing so. So that's one example. Then we have an excellent example, and uh, as I talked about the houses that we look at, it's the property tax part, where people living in, I mean, I can give you actual numbers, people living in 4,000 square yards are actually paying a property tax of less than $200. Prime property. Uh, maintained by the state, uh, maintained by the local government. Then you have capital gains. People actually in, uh, interacting in co uh, economic transactions related to, to land, the stock market, and of course, very lightly taxed. Uh, 
And then those holding financial assets in the form of either uh, uh, equity or in the form of large deposits pay a much lower rate of tax. So I mean, it's, it's that which the system which seems to be rigged against Absolutely. every other segment of society. They've been fully protected and of course continue to get that protection. I mean, the, the most recent example being the relief given, so-called relief given to the construction sector. So in a sense, the system has actually historically been rigged in favor of the richer segments of society. And I can go on as to the number of uh, things that have happened. Um, I totally agree political governments have had responded um, because they have no choice. They have to fight an election every five years and they are forced to respond despite not being able to change the structure in a much more favorable manner towards the less affluent segments of society. I know they're very fond of running down Pindi. I fall in that same category. But I keep asking myself three, four questions. One, who negotiated the independent power projects that we are all lamenting about? The civilian side. Who runs the steel mill and made what it is today? Again, us. The way we can't seem to do anything about the education sector is again us. The Pindiwalas are not stopping from, from doing that. We can't seem to run the railways. We can't seem to run PIA. And I think we must ask ourselves. It's very easy to run down Pindi. I hold no brief for them. But we must ask ourselves as well. Because we don't realize the drain, just to give you an example, the drain of these mismanaged state-owned enterprises, which means some of the money has to come through indirect taxes, is now 2.3 trillion. And who's going to pay for it? Because the more affluent segment of so segments of society are not going to pay for it. So no wonder you end up. And then you have a size of the state structure. Even after the 18th Amendment, even after the 18th Amendment, the size of the federal government has increased. Why? It is in the interest of both politicians and bureaucrats to have a large federal government. The bureaucrat is thinking, I don't want to retire not being a secretary. The politicians are looking for a ministerial position. So in a sense, some of the things that we should have done, frankly, we haven't. One other item that I emphasize, and I, I think there are other questions yeah. which, uh, one of the things we don't realize in terms of the inequality part is that the size of households has actually come down and narrowed the number of persons per household amongst the richest segments of society have reduced. Yes. And at the lower it's end, the it's the other way. Yes. So in a sense, if you look at the per capita, in per capita terms, the inequality yes. gap has actually grown. Right. Yep. There is much more purchasing power now with the top 20%, which wasn't the case earlier because they had large families. So that aspect has also grown. And uh, so I'll just stop here. Uh, what are the rights which we have to be asking for? What are the laws that we need to ask for when we agitate, as he suggests, on the street? This agenda has to emerge from a very, very deep understanding of the root causes of inequality. And that is why I, I am glad that he has uh, announced uh, a street-wide movement, wonderful, but we will help him by giving him some agenda. So I'll turn to Kardar Saab and ask him, perhaps he can give us some specific issues that need to be focused on through legislation achieved through public participation and movement. And, uh, I like what uh, Kassar said about that they've all, they've ruled all along, huh? All that was changing was the party in government. So, <laughs> so they're the ones who actually switched from party to party. Um, the other thing, um, Jan Tak, he mentioned the Bhagavad or the um, revolution that he refers to. I think we seem, while we are talking, that's all we do. I mean, I can only put myself in that category. The boys in the TLP and the others are telling us what the way is. You, and I think I tend to agree with you,
that when we talk about laws, we seem to be talking about sections of the law. While those guys are saying, forget this law, these guys will never let you have any kind of social mobility. And so that, to me, is the crux of the matter. How do we create a, 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 a system which provides that kind of social mobility which you would expect to see in any civilized society? A decent system of economic and social services which enables them to get the kind of education, the kind of skills that will give them that mobility. I think, to me, that's the key. And that's where we've actually, actually failed to provide completely. To me, that is the starting point. The second is that we keep forgetting that we are a federation. The federation requires us to be actually, actually use all the institutions that we have, and that is the CCI, the National Economic Council, the parliamentary committees, and that's the one which will give them, and of course this government has decided not to use any of these institutions. So that is the key to be able to have that kind of stakeholder participation to create that kind of social cohesion that we're looking for. As regards the resources part to, to be able to pay for all this and give people a fairly decent way forward, I think much of the problem, frankly, lies on the expenditure side and not on the revenue side, in my opinion. It's the bloated state which needs to be adjusted and frankly worry about the, 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 the revenue part later. The reason I emphasize it, every time you give them an additional rupee, they will actually start using it for something else, for their own lifestyles, for the lifestyles of the prayers and, and those in Pindi. Now the reason I emphasize it, I think it's critical because you, we need to recognize that this way of governance, this way of both economic and political governance needs to change. That is, that is what essentially is dragging us down. And how we manage to do it through a, a broader stakeholder participation is important. The rich must pay their way. Adjustments in society will have to be born based on different groups' ability to bear that burden. The rich must pay a much higher burden, and that brings us to the whole question of income taxes, the, the wealth taxes, and things like that. It's until unless we change this system, which is much fairer than we have, what we've managed to do so far, I think we will never get the kind of acceptance. I mean, and I end by saying, when I look, when I started reading about these young kids who were wearing suicide belts, I used to ask myself, why is it he wants to end up in heaven? Is that the, the somehow uh, the, um, what you and I would call the propaganda that he's imbibed and, and swallowed? No, the reason was very simple. Have you given him a stake in this system? Have you given him a stake if he wants to blow it up? I can understand. He has no stake in this system. You have to give him a stake in this system, which, is, which requires a much fairer and a much more just society, the kind of society that Asma and the Ayurveda of this world are fighting for. Thank you. Thank you.